contributed in shaping Nigeria's uh, development context, those you've worked with. So we'll, we'll give Dr. Saki the floor for 10 minutes to help us um, go through this, this point, and then we'll come back to the, to the next speaker. Uh, our, our panelists, just to say that um, uh, we have someone, to, we have people, a team of people taking comprehensive note at the end of this meeting. Uh, we'll normally come up with a policy brief, that's um, policy paper that is going to be made public. Uh, we are going to share the notes of the meeting with all the panelists because you've registered. And also, if you have comments at some point, hoping that time permits, we're going to open the floor to the um, to the participant to ask questions face to face. But if you have questions, please put it put it down in the in the tab. Just type in your questions in the comments and session, and we would uh, at some point come. Um, we are collating them, and at some point we we'll would respond to them and hopefully give other people room to speak. So, Mr. Dabasaki, you have the floor. Um, thank you and good morning to everyone. So Andrew, I think you set me up to be in a very complicated situation. Um, I, I want to first of all say thank you for inviting us um, as the Ford Foundation to offer some views in this, I think, um, timely conversation. Um, so I would be doing, my intervention would be looking backwards and, uh, and today and then forwards as well. So just to say that, you know, historically civil society has really played important roles in addressing some of the dysfunctions in the Nigerian society. And uh, interestingly, some of these roles actually go all the way back to the pre-colonial era. Um, so as early as um, 1912, you know, there had been civil society groups, particularly um, labor related groups that had started to agitate for reform in, in the Lugard-led civil, um, civil service in, in Nigeria. You know, and um, both in the 1910s and the 1920s, there was a very vibrant you know, movement of young people and women in, in Nigeria. And because I'm fairly familiar with both constituencies, you know, I would try to keep my focus on both. So um, in the early 1920s, you had you know, the um, Union of Young Nigerians that really started to advocate for um, better access to education for, for young Nigerians, education reform. And that group continued to exist uh, up till the mid thirties and metamorphosed into um, the Nigerian youth movement. So first to the Lagos youth movement and then later to the Nigerian youth movement. And uh, particularly in the 1930s, it was really interesting that this group was focused on uh, education policy in a way that actually will blow the minds of a lot of people today. Because one of the points that they were arguing against was in fact that the administration of the day should not substitute a Nigerian certificate for uh, Oxford Cambridge certificate. So they were insisting that the Nigerian cert certificate should be maintained, and which is actually quite interesting when you compare it to today's trends, right? Um, and then also in the 20s, you had actually very strong women's movements. You know, I guess, you know, the most popular of all of these is the Abba, Abba women's protest that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about. But when you look at that era, you actually had a number of other women's movements that were very, you know, strong and really called for better opportunities for, for women in society. So I, one example that I would cite here is the Lagos Women's League that was really pushing for more spaces for um, women in, in the public service of the day. So just to say that um, civil society has existed in some form you know, at different points in, in Nigeria's history. And I wanted to provide this background because I think it would help in terms of thinking about what should civil society do in, in the context of COVID-19? So um, a paper that was written by Darren Q and Chris Kwaja actually looks at four generations of civil society in Nigeria, which you know, I thought was actually interesting to kind of share. The first generation, which they describe as the pre-colonial generation was really dominated by religious, traditional and ethnic you know, groupings. Um, and as I said before, um, these groups were involved in different types of agitations. And, and I know in some sense that one might think policy reform uh, is not necessarily a thing 
that would apply to community leaders. But actually, it's very interesting that given the political administration of the time, one could say that policy reform was a very important topic for even the pre-colonial era. And that particular point you know, was um, highlighted in colonial days when young men in Lagos um, protested against the amount of money that they had to pay as bride price and said that they were not going to marry if the bride price was not reduced. So there's been a long history of political consciousness, you know, and the pre-colonial era, you know, really heralds, you know, the emergence of what we now know as our modern, modern civil society in Nigeria. The second era that they talk about started from 1914. And in fact, I would push it back to 1912, given that there was some um, engagement of trade unions as early as 1912. So they talk about that group as being as involving um, trade unions, professional associations, chambers of commerce, and student organizations. Um, the third generation that they talk about, you know, started from 1980, and uh, basically, you know, heralded the arrival of NGOs, you know, so what we now, you know, mostly know as civil society, according to them, you know, emerged in the 1980s. And then they talk about the fourth, you know, generation, which in their writing is more the last generation, which is based on so, uh, social media, so social media based movements. And one can think that, you know, um, as early as 2001, you know, even before the emergence of what we now know as social media. So even before the arrival of companies like uh, Facebook, you know, there were youth led, you know, social media platforms like Taking It Global that actually provided the space for young leaders to aggregate ideas, to share ideas and to agitate for policy change in a number of diverse areas. Um, so in a nutshell, I'm saying that there's been a long history of organizing and civil society work in, in this country. And to say that the things that civil society groups did historically, there are quite a few of them, but I would try and look at the things that run across the entire four generations of civil society, if you like. The first is education reform. So that's been prominent, you know, both pre-independence and post-independence. It's continued to be a relevant topic even now. You know, um, in the 1930s, young people in Lagos tried to raise money to support, you know, the um, purchase of facilities for a higher education institution here because the institution was not receiving enough funding. You know, they weren't able to raise enough money at the time, but, you know, this was an effort that they were leading, you know, to support higher education here. Um, and as a way of protesting, you know, the British colonial administration's attitude to higher education in Nigeria. So education has been a topic that has been prominent both, you know, in colonial times and even today. The second topic that I think, you know, runs across the time is, you know, the question of better and equal wages. Um, and th there's a whole spectrum of possibilities there. You know, I would include there the question of economic opportunities, you know. Um, so when you look at, you know, the, the work of the Lagos Women's League, for example, it was about opportunity, but it was also about wages for, for women, you know, in, in the country. So, and that topic has remained, you know, relevant even now, particularly when you think about it from the lens of economic opportunity. Um, today, the question of equal wages is becoming more and more prominent, you know, around the world, you know, some of the more innovative work, you know, has been done in the UK and elsewhere. Um, but increasingly, this is becoming a topic of interest here that, you know, women and men deserve equal wages, and there's a need to really pay attention to this particular area of discourse. Um, the third point that I would make is about um, the whole question of citizens participation, you know, um, again, the whole point of colon the colonial struggle was really about, you know, en enabling citizens to participate in the governance of their own affairs, you know, and in some sense, you know, that topic remains relevant even today. Um, the fourth, you know, I, that I would talk about is the whole question of policy change, you know, for a whole range of things, policy change to 
to create spaces for different range of citizens to be involved in decision making for to better the lives of citizens to address the economic conditions of citizens and actually one point that stands out for me was the, the, the driving force for both the Abba women's riot and the Abiyokuta women's revolt. That was a question of taxation. And that was essentially a question that had to do with policy change. You know, the need to reform the policy, change the policy so that better conditions will exist for women. And then the final thing that I would say with regard to agendas that I think have been relevant both in colonial times and today is the question of self-determination. You know, so you know, in, increasingly in different parts of the country, there have been agitations for um, both, you know, citizens who want to manage their own affairs, you know, in terms of setting up their own, you know, uh, sovereign entities, but also in terms of the management of their natural resources. You know, so there's been, particularly in regions like the Niger Delta, there's been increased argument for resource control for the management of resources and when you think about that it's actually about you know ensuring that citizens benefit from the gains of um, natural resources in their in their respective locales i know that i've taken a bit of time so i'm just going to get straight to the last point which is your question yeah, about so, Mr. Wasaki, maybe um we we'll just hold on for the second round and then you will go okay. into um do the, you mind the if last the last point and then because i think it would be good to just make the connection um, and then we can oh, okay two minutes i just wanted to say that um the interesting thing about the history is that there's been across time a unifying agenda for the different groupings that emerged you know for the for the women's protest it was about opportunity taxation and the rest of them i think in some sense that to your question about what should civil society do, you know, going forward? You know, I think the 80s heralded the era of enjoyization of civil society. So we've now kind of exclusively focused on institutions that are structured as NGOs. And that means that we've risked losing out of innovative social movements that really agitate for change on particular important issues. So if you talk about self-determination, for example, there are groupings that agitate for change in those directions that we don't sufficiently target because we are focusing on NGOs that are structured in a particular way. And I think when we think about what can civil society do or what should civil society do, to my mind, it brings to bear the question about what is the role of civil society? Is the role of civil society to provide services? Is the role of civil society to advocate for policy change in a, in a range of different areas? Or is the role of civil society both? And if it is, how do we find the right balance between the provision of services and agitation and advocacy for policy reform and change that the country desperately needs? I'm going to stop there and maybe come back to the question of COVID later. Yeah, thank you very much, Dabesaki. Uh, I think this is a good insight about of, um, looking at the development agenda where we started from as civil society and uh, where we are right now. Uh, the four dispensation um, that you rightly put forward, I think these are very apt. and. For us, it's it's all related to COVID. Uh, uh, pardon me. I probably go to um, Madam Zoya if you could tell us, looking at um, the foundations, um, um, like we have in the country country today. Um, Dangote Foundation is um, the biggest uh, private foundation in in Africa. Um, so, could you uh, tell us? Um, from the point of the foundation, how what has been done by the foundation with regards to these issues that have been uh, have been mentioned, uh, specifically, we, we want you to look at um, the private sector's role and funding opportunities for community development. So, uh, what has the foundation been able to to do all these years? Um, where do private foundations such as yours and um, you have a lot of uh, CSRO unit? For, for big corporates uh, or, and big multinationals um, in Nigeria, what have they been able to do in influencing the development agenda in Nigeria? 
uh, and also how are private foundations um, and multinational, multinational, multinationals matching their CSRO and development strategies against the current COVID-19 funding initiatives. Um, we see lots of donations on, on, on TV, a lot of uh, organizations come, kind of coming up with truck rules of, of, of rights, of livelihood items. But um, beyond just those uh, sustainable items, what, what else, uh, how, has, how has foundations influenced uh, or contributed to the whole um, um, debate and issues around um, COVID-19? And also, uh, what does development agenda look, look like Post development agenda look for post uh, development agenda looks like post COVID uh, at the end of the day. So um, I don't know if you will be able to give us an insight from um, Dangote, Adiko Dangote Foundation perspective, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, first of all, really thank you for for inviting me. Uh, I'm I'm a little tired today, and I was telling Dr. Amina earlier, like my own you know COVID impact in my life is with my daughter just graduated from high school in South Africa. And they were repatriated yesterday. And the flight didn't get in until two o'clock in the morning instead of seven. So <clears throat> that's why I sound a little, oh, I didn't get enough sleep last night. But I think COVID has disrupted our lives in ways that we haven't um, anticipated. And I think it leads us right into this idea of, you know, what is the role of private foundations in the development agenda? I think that's a really interesting question because I think it's new. Um, I remember uh, when Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave their huge, I think it was a billion dollars they gave to the UN. And it was a shocking, it was like a revolutionary. Nobody had ever thought of, like, how do we support those kinds of institutions? You know, philanthropy was about, you know, art, or even if you cared about health, it was, you know, organizations that would do specific things were focused on eyesight or fixing faces. It wasn't, we, we hadn't seen the philanthropy sector really look at big development issues like we're seeing it now. So just that as a prelude, it was philanthropy was, you know, let me see how I can do good for humanity because God has blessed me with funds, right? Or if you're a corporate foundation like the NTN Foundation, I'm sure that if I was going to tell us more about that, how do you take, you know, the, the money that the company has made, how do you use some of it to improve the lives of the people either in your community, in your catchment area, if you're a, a manufacturing company, for instance. So I think um, the role has changed a lot. And I think it's a constant balancing act between how do we do practical things that solve the problems that we know are there and influencing policy. Like what Dr. Saki was just um, he was talking about agitating for change, but wouldn't necessarily agitate, but advocate in a, in a, in a different way, right? So the, the Idea of the Foundation was um, started a very long time ago in 1993 by Anajit Ali the goal at the time for him, it was, hmm, I'm starting to make money. I know that I have to give back um, to humanity, <clears throat> to whom much is given, much is required, you know, all these things that we all believe. Um, and he was really driven by that. And he started his organization, which was a charity. So they were literally giving money away, food, drugs, um, you know, paying people scholarships. It was very, let me just help. And in the past few years, it was more about, okay, let's restructure the foundation so that we have a strategy, we have a plan, we have a board, we have a budget, we have you know, programs that we deliver. And so it's the same foundation, the same goal, but now with more articulated goals, if you will. So we focus on four things, um, health, obviously, education, makes perfect sense, empowerment, and then disaster relief is like a wrap about that pops up whenever we need it. Obviously, we've been doing a lot more disaster relief over the past five years than we ever have um, in the past. But the, the, the goal really is on the health agenda. And somebody had talked about polio a little bit earlier. How do we use our, we're a Nigerian organization based in Nigeria. Yes, we work across the continent and even internationally, like across the globe. But here in Nigeria, what can we do? How can we influence what is going on in Nigeria to improve the outcome of 
people's lives in Nigeria. So to pick health, as an example, we all know that the health system in Nigeria is um, in need of improvement. We have to do better in terms of facilities, in terms of private health care, in terms of the insurance scheme, in terms of the outrageously high out-of-pocket expenses that people have to deal with. We know that all these things, everybody knows this, right? And the moments like COVID make it more real because now nobody can fly out for, you know, special treatment in the U.S. or in Dubai. We're all stuck here. So what do we do? So the importance of investing in our own health care has been, um, if you will, revealed and, and, and maximized. Now, how do we work with the normal, let me call the traditional development partners? Um, it was really important for us at ADF to become and be seen as a donor. Why? A lot of the discussions that happen typically, and I worked for the World Bank for 10 years, so this is why I know what I'm talking about. Before that, I talked, I worked for the European Union also when I was in, um, back in the day in Asia, one of my first jobs. The truth is when the development agenda is set and developed and institutions are deciding what to do, uh, not to pick on anybody, but let's say um, DFID is working on four states in Nigeria, that's what they wanna do. How do we make sure that we have what we need? Um, nutrition, child malnutrition is a problem in Nigeria. If we all just recognize that the first thousand days of a child's life are the critical determining days of what that person's future is going to be, if we don't focus on those thousand days, then we're going to end up with people who whose brains are stunted, whose bodies are stunted, whose potential is already reduced, right? So then what kind of school are they gonna go to? What kind of people are they gonna end up being? How are they gonna contribute to Nigeria as a whole? But nutrition isn't really, it's, it's not like an interesting topic. Like people don't like it. It's a difficult topic to, 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 to circumscribe in one area. It's a health issue, it's an education issue of the mothers, it's a, you know, food issue, it's an agriculture, issue. it's so many different issues, it's so cross-cutting that it just is difficult to address and a lot of people haven't been addressing it. So this is one of those things where we said, you know what, we are going to focus on nutrition here in Nigeria. The problems are obviously in the northern part of the country, a lot worse than in the southern part of the country, but we don't have, a, it doesn't matter. We don't have to be politically correct, geographically balanced. We just have to go where the you know, resolving the problem that we see exists. Now, at the same time, uh, COVID has now hit. Um, in the introduction, I think it was N.A. talking about the, the increase in poverty, the number of people who've lost their livelihood it goes to follow that the children of those people are struggling in a different way around nutrition. So we've had to increase and step up our efforts in that particular nutrition space. So this is just to give you kind of a, 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 a sense of what we can do. Now, in terms of influencing, I think when you have a company that's big and that's listed on the stock exchange in Nigeria, like the Dungote, Group of companies, are, you probably have an extra responsibility to be a good corporate citizen, right? So all the groups do CSR. Their CSR used to be kind of mixed in with the Dante Foundation, and you know it was it, it was the, the lines were a little bit blurred between what was meant, um, you know. CSR and what was further DSR, for instance. But now we've really made it different. Aliko Dante Foundation is Alija Aliko Dante's personal foundation. This is what he's doing. This is his money. It's not connected to what his company is doing. So cement as a company has to do CSR that makes sense for cement. They have to take care of their um, the communities where they work. They have to make sure that they behave in a way that is um, that, you know, that improves their social license to operate, et cetera. So the, there's a big distinction between the philanthropy at Equal Dangote Foundation, which is why we had to rebrand and we have a new logo, et cetera. And then the company um, where they do their own specific CSR. Now we give them advice, 
Um, we help them, we guide, we support, we encourage, we find them consultants, et cetera. But CSI is separate from um, the philanthropy piece. And I'm really proud of the fact that we've been able to, to get on top of this agenda because when um, the polio work started in Nigeria, ADF wasn't involved, but our involvement wasn't just money that we brought to the table to increase the more vaccines, doing you know agreements with states to get them to expand coverage of um, immunization in their states, but it was also influence, right? There was a lot of skepticism around you know, who are the people, where are they coming from? Why do they want to drop my baby's mouth? I don't know. You know, all the different theories that we've heard um, that, that holds back. So when Energy was able to, you know, demonstrate to people, look, I'm giving my own grandchild the vaccine. We've been able to get the traditional rulers to come in and endorse that. That influence changed how the polio outcome that we're celebrating today um, happened to be. So it's using our voice, our influence, the people we know, who we can talk to, in addition to bringing money, solving some of these um, issues. Now, the COVID-19 um, drama has shifted a lot of things. Um, for instance, we were all set to start um, in, uh, an education program that was specifically a school in Northern Nigeria, in Meduguri, um, that we were going to take over. We we're going to start coming in September. We had started doing all the you know, pre-selection of the kids, but now we don't even know when schools are gonna open. So that is on hold. So that always brings us back to well, what else should we be doing? How do we advocate for equal quality education for Nigerian children across the country? So that is a, a, a much bigger, longer term policy agenda. While we're doing that, we also have to have the actual schools. Where are the kids gonna go? Right. How do we make sure that there's internet connectivity so that the kids, we keep talking about online. I mean, it's heartbreaking that most kids in Nigeria can't do online school. When the school goes, they just don't go to school because there's not um, internet infrastructure. They don't have devices. They don't have tablets, phones. And maybe we should talk to MTN to you know, help us with that. That we've been talking with Ferdy about how do we really you know, do that? Because if you have more, um, bandwidth across the country, not as MT MTN's job by themselves to do it, but if we had bandwidth, then we could develop the programs and find the affordable tools that the children could use across the country. So this is one of the things that I think focus will be, um, be more focused on that because of COVID. Now our agenda post COVID isn't really changing. It's really gonna be about how do we empower people? I think we're gonna be doing more of the micro grants. I think we have eight states this in the next three months where we're slated. This micro grant program is where we give a um, thousand women in each LGA in the state money to increase her, um, her income generating ability. So we've been doing that. Uh, the goal is to reach, you know, a thousand women in all 774 LGA in Nigeria. We've done about half, but we're about to accelerate because the the, the challenges are, are gigantic. And even states that were doing better before COVID have been, you know, asking us to to to, to accelerate the micro grant program, which we're going to do. So I think the 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 the. the the reality is we want more um, foundations. We want more private personal foundations of people to, to exist. We don't have enough of those in Nigeria. And we have a lot of people who are wealthy, who have money, who can do this. Um, and we need to work together with the traditional donor groups. And we need to work with the government, the federal government, the state government. But I think it's really important that people who have the ability to really, really step up and take an active role in solving our own African slash Nigerian problems. Okay. Thank you very much, Jara. I think that was very insightful. Um, knowing all the um, things that the foundation is doing and how you are influencing um, the development agenda, influencing policy. Uh, there is a question that will probably come back to you later on. And maybe all the panelists will also take a shot at that. Um, the issue of, we all know that Nigeria can always do better um, in terms of where um, our trajectory, our road to development. 
um, how do we speed up that approach? How do we get um, development partners looking at donors, looking at uh, foundations? How do we get all of these to influence that agenda in a big way? How do we get uh, Maliko Dangote Foundation with MTN Foundation, with Ford Foundation, with the DFID, with Global First Canada, with USAID, having that big push? I know it happens, of course, uh, I'm aware of the development, um, development sector space. Uh, um, I'm aware of the uh, private sector space as well through some push, but can we um, have a um, com coming together of all of these group and put more, more pressure or put more, a little more push um, in engaging the government? Yeah, we know that there are issues of uh, diplomacy at play in terms of government to government engagement. There's issue of diplomacy at play in terms of private foundation, of course, you are for profit, so you have to be careful of the level of engagement. But where, where does civil society fit in in all of this? How do we all um, engage with civil society to be able to, to achieve this? Well, I, I will come back to that to, to, to respond to that question, because the person was talking specifically around, um, can we graduate from the monthly sharing allocation to real, um, of, to, 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 of our economy? to knowledge economy, how do we drive our economy? And we, we talked about the whole work of the foundation around the education sector and possible collaboration with MTN to get tablets across board. By the way, MTN has been doing very well in, in, in terms of engaging in the education sector and also in the health sector. But of course, much, much more is expected from, from the foundation. So how do we all collaborate in, in achieving this? So um, before I come to Kevin, um, so Kevin, I'm gonna to come to you uh, after Odunaya. Sorry, Odunayo. So, um, Odunayo, let, let's look at um, the uh, MTN Foundation. Uh, MTN Foundation has done very well for itself. It's known for its work around education and the, the health sector. And um, it stands out um, among the uh, private foundation in, in the country today. Uh, but clearly, there are still a whole lot to be done, like I, like I said earlier on. So we want to discuss the private sector role and funding opportunities for community development. So um, the uh, essence of, uh, one of the essence of the foundation, of course, is, is, is to tell towards community development. Yes, CSR in a way, but also community development. Now mm -hmm. on the issue of, um, with, with, a, with a huge resources that is channeled through the um, foundation, and I know much more can be channeled through, through the foundation. How do you, uh, deal with issue of uh, value for money um, as a foundation and um, ensuring that maximum impact is, is, um, is gotten at the community level. Um, how do you ensure that every penny spent, you get value for money for every Naira you, have, you are spending in the community? Uh, what is the place of the poor and excluded, including women and children within your, um, your strategy, uh, your CSR development strategy? And also, uh, also for, for that of the foundation, I'm aware that the MTM being a leader, you engage with other fund, uh, with other foundations and other other uh, CSRO CSRO units of other uh, private sector organization. So, uh, how do you ensure that the it's actually the need of the poor and excluded, the voice of that woman in that rural community, mm -hmm. uh, probably go to bed without food tonight. How do you um, ensure that that voice um, drives your, your development agenda? And um, how do you build and sustain relationship uh, between private foundations and civil society organizations? You work with a lot of civil society organizations, I'm aware of that. Um, the first time I had a chat with MTN, uh, I, I learned something around, you receive a, an average of 200 applications, like 200 applications, like every week or every day, something like that. So I know you work with a lot of civil society organizations, but how do you how do we sustain and improve on that in, on that relationship? I think we could start from from, from those um, those points. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. A lot of points. Uh, I hope I'm able to, you know, fully address uh, them. Um, and thank you, Zuera, for giving an insight into you know how uh, private uh, uh, foundations run using your foundation as as an example. Thank you, Dabasaki, for for you know taking us back into, you know, some form of history to get back to where we are uh, today. Uh, the MTN Foundation is, is 15 years old in terms of uh, operating uh, 
in Nigeria. Uh, we're going to be 15 in September. We were uh, founded uh, in 2004, but we started operations uh, in 2005. Um, the reason behind the, the MTN Foundation is that at MTN, as, as, as a company, we were driven by a singular core belief. And what that belief is, is that every individual deserves, you know, the benefits of a modern connected life. And so this finds expression in all that MTN does, also through the found, foundation. Uh, MTN exists in about uh, 21 countries uh, across Africa and the Middle East, and every one of them has an MTN foundation. So back to MCN Nigeria. Over the years, uh, a lot, you know, has been done. Uh, there's still so much more, like you rightly said, to be done. Um, MTN Foundation, MTN Nigeria Foundation is funded uh, solely by MTN Nigeria. Um, and it's, it's through a dedicated commitment of 1% uh, of MTN Nigeria's profit after tax. So MTN Nigeria will, you know, on an annual basis, donate to the, the foundation 1% of its profit after tax to enable, you know, the, the, and lift up uh, the standard of lives of, our, of living within our communities and for individuals. Uh, over the years, we've, uh, we've, support, we've focused on certain portfolios, which for us are key to our development as a nation because you know, for us, national priority is also part of what we look at. Um, the, the portfolios we focused on, a bit similar to what Zuera had uh, talked about, we focus, we're heavily invested in education, we're invested in health um, and youth you know, empowerment, we're, we're, we're high on that, and also community development like Andrew, uh, mentioned. Over the years, we've rolled out a number of uh, initiatives, of which I will speak to a few. And um, that is my attempt to sh share with you and with all of us uh, on the call today how we have brought in, you know, excluded groups like maybe women, children, and uh, even those that are differently able from, from us. Uh, so I'll start with the MTN. Um, scholarship scheme. Uh, we have two schemes that run. So the first scheme we have is uh, the scholarship for the science and technology. Uh, people ask, why are we focused on science and technology? It's not because the other courses don't matter, but we recognize that as a nation, we need to catch up. We're playing a catch-up game, and we're even losing within that in that catch-up game. And the one way that we can catch up is, you know, when we can leapfrog using science and technology. So uh, our scholarship scheme is focused on, on uh, science and technology. Uh, we don't do uh, medicine, but we do uh, all kinds of uh, courses under uh, a STEM. Um, over the years, we've, um, we've been able to issue out over 10,000 grants of which uh, the actual beneficiaries, the recipients, are about 3,400. Now, there's, you see there's a disparity in, in the figure. Now, the count of grants is about 10, uh, a little above 10,000, but the beneficiaries are just about 3,400. The reason is because MTN stays with you from your third year in school. We want to be there for you till you finish you know, your five-year course in school. So the same person ends up getting, if you meet uh, you know, the criteria of a CGP of about 3.5, you, uh, you keep getting the scholarship until you leave school. Uh, we also run the scheme for the blind. So we have a scholarship scheme for the blind because at MTN we believe really no one should be left uh, behind. And so over the years, we've, we've been able to uh, sponsor about uh, 450 blind uh, Nigerians uh, through school. And we have great testimonies of them, you know, working in private sector and doing re really well. And that's how in, in one way we bring, you know, the young people, because we reckon it's, it's not news. We're very, we're a nation of young people and we need to harness 
you know, the energy of the young people. Now, in terms of uh, health, we've, uh, there are a few other things we do uh, for education. We, we run a scholarship scheme with the Muson, um, the Musical Society of Nigeria, where we, we train uh, young Nigerians that are musically inclined uh, through getting a diploma. And a lot of them also have graced international stages. Some of them are outside the country and a lot of them are doing well. We also extend under education into uh, arts and culture. Uh, I'll move on to the health portfolio. Uh, over the years, MTN has played significantly, you know, in, in the space of health. And uh, like Zuera said, it's, it's, it's a broken down system and we're all in it now because nobody can go anywhere, regardless of how highly placed you are within uh, the society. Over the years, we've supported, we've focused on, uh, on a cause we call uh, mother and child health. And what this has done for us is that we've, we've gone to, we've been able to uh, rehabilitate a number of maternal words words for um, maternity wards in public um, hospitals, teaching hospitals across the nation. And this is also because, you know, for us, we need to, the, the target is about reducing uh, maternal mortality and also child mortality rates. We, we're, we're tar our target is to reduce all of this. So we have, you know, worked together with the public sector uh, the health sector, and we've remodeled and refurbished a number of uh, teaching hospitals across uh, Nigeria. We've also gone into the into the rural uh, model for health, where we we have trucks. Uh, we call them the yellow uh, doctor trucks that go into the hinterland, and you know they offer services to. The, the services prioritize women and children, but yes, anyone who, who, who comes in there, we, we offer uh, services. And uh, from inception till date, uh, we have through the Yellow Doctor Scheme, we've touched uh, well over uh, 500,000 people. Uh, so that's it about health. In terms of health too, we've, we've worked with uh, the Sickle Cell Society of Nigeria. And I know last year we did uh, gift them with um, a DNA lab in, in, in Idi Araba here in Lagos, where you know, they can do genetic testing uh, for um, pregnant uh, women. And that's still connected to you know, our, our, our goal to take women you know, on the journey of, of life. So those are some of the things we've done within the health um, uh, sector health, for, uh, sector for the for youth empowerment, uh, we've we've from the scholarships. We've done a few other things. So we've, we've also we concluded the. I'm getting feedback. I don't know why. I'm getting feedback. I don't know why. Okay. So we 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 run other programs such as the ICT and business skills training. Uh, we also reckon that you know when you expose people. Uh, to the use of technology, uh, you give them a new lease of life. They can begin to do things by themselves. And together with our ecosystem partners, such as Cisco, um, KPMG, um, Oracle, we, we, there's, there's, a, there's a curriculum that we do roll out for young Nigerians uh, every year, where we take you through and we brush you up in the use of um, ICT, and also we teach you, you know, entrepreneurial skills in the same uh, training. We've taught a lot of uh, young Nigerians. And uh, so let me now move uh, forward because I know I don't have time. Um, I could also talk about our community development. There's, there's something that we do. You, you did mention how do we get the voice of the people. Um, so there's, there's a program that we run in, at the foundation. What can, we call it, what can we do together? Um, and it's, it's a platform that is open to every Nigerian to nominate a, a community, you know, to get this year, it's, it's, it's getting the gift of a borehole, a solar powered borehole or um, an ICT lab for a school. You know, we had planned this before uh, the COVID, but in, other streams that we had run in the past, the primary healthcare centers were also um, 
nominated for ref for them to be refurbished and you know getting them to work. So what we do under the What Can We Do Together umbrella is that we open up. Uh, you know, it's a coincidence. A platform, the call opened yesterday, so we open up a call, um, and then Nigerians send in entries as to various communities that they would like to be touched by, you know, the What Can We Do Together program. And that is also MTN's way of getting us to think about the other people, you know, getting us to, as Nigerians, to adopt the culture of giving back. Yes, it's not the individual's fund that gets used, but hey, the individual has a part to play because you have to nominate um, a community. And We've seen instances where people have nominated not their own communities, but other communities. And that tells you, you know, a lot when you see people nominating other communities aside from theirs. It tells you that indeed they're good people within, you know, our, our country. So it's been, it's, it's opened up. You can visit mtnonline.com uh, to find out, uh, you know, more about that. I'll also share some materials with action aid and you can uh, share with the people on 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 this uh, platform and through the 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 what can we do together program we've touched over 510 communities in Nigeria as we speak today uh, looking at our our um, footprint our CSI footprint across Nigeria we have touched every single state including the the, the FCT and we have actively, you know, gone into 510 hinterland communities to, you know, give them some, either a borehole, uh, an ICT lab, refurbish the primary healthcare center. And this has really elevated, you know, the lives of, of, of uh, the people in those uh, communities. In terms of collaboration, like you said, there's a lot uh, for private, uh, foundations or be it, you know, the MTN foundation is different from MTN. We have a board, we, we, we exist separately from, from the commercial business, but there's still a lot to be done. And I, I see that the power that we bring to the table as the private sector will be the power of collaboration with each other and also, you know, with the government post COVID. Because things are, as we know, the economy is, 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 is really shaky right now. And so it's going to take a lot of uh, efforts beyond what the government can do to get people what they really need and get people out of uh, 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 poverty. I think it was Enne that was saying at the beginning that, you know, she believes poverty can be eradicated. And we also, you know, really believe that at the MTM Foundation. So really, if we're able to collaborate, either through setting up of a full-fledged foundation within our, our, our organizations, or even setting aside a desk within that organization to look at these things, and then collaborating with uh, civil society, other NGOs, then we will be, you know, on we'll be on track. For us at the foundation, things have not really changed. So our the call for the scholarships did open about a week ago. And as at Friday last week, we had received 11,000 applications. Uh, we, like I said, the What Can We Do Together has, uh, has opened up. Um, we're also heavy on, like I said, youth empowerment. And last year we launched what we call the ASAP campaign, the Anti-Substance Abuse Program campaign uh, with a lot of advocacy, uh, initiatives and the target really is to prevent first time users to give them by giving them information they need so that they can make the right choices and uh, even though we can't gather today today is the international day against uh, drug abuse and illicit trafficking uh, at the foundation we've collaborated with other uh, bodies and we have um, we have what we call the drug convos uh, by 2 p.m today so those are some of the things we keep doing. No doubt some things will change. Um, Zuera talked about education. We are also looking, she says she's talked with uh, Ferdi, and yes, we're, we're looking at how do we, um, and it's a tough call, but how can we, if we join hands together and we pull resources together, then we can begin to speak to education in this era of, you know, um, of social distancing where the bulk of the children can't even go to school. 
and so those are some some of the things we talked about value for money i think for us it's about monitoring and evaluation we have a robust monitoring and evaluation framework uh, we have a framework whereby you know we, it, we we test we get our baseline and we roll out and even after that we continue to check within uh, the, the community. No doubt we've had one or two projects that didn't go quite well, but for us, we've had to take learnings, you know, from, from those and, you know, pull, put them back into products, uh, sorry, projects that we're doing. Thank you very much. I know I've taken so much time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dunaya. We really appreciate, uh, appreciate this. Um, I like the parts around uh, what's, what can we do together and um, the call to action, because we're not just having this uh, webinar for having its sake. Um, we have to come up with clear actions. What can we do together? How do we promote that collaboration? How do we do there something we can start from this process? I'm sure Enel, Enel will um, lead us through that process at, at some point. So um, I'm going to Global Affairs Canada now. Kevin, I've saved you for, for now. Um, Global Affairs Canada has um, have the niche for itself as um, a gender, women's rights, um, sensitive, focused organization. So you are like in the lead in within globally on issues of funding for uh, issues around um, 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 women's rights. Um, in Nigeria, surprisingly, um, the issues of um, gender-based violence, particularly issues of rape, has been on the increase. Um, we had a debate recently in the office where we're talking about it. Is, it, is, it, is it that it has actually increased or is there an issue of the reportage has increased? And we came up with the I did, um, um, conclusion, came to the conclusion that it's actually both. So both the reportage, the reportage has increased, which is a good thing, but the, the practice seems to be increasing. And then Global Affairs Canada has taken the lead in supporting women's rights organization. Just to say in Nigeria, uh, Global Affairs Canada works with Action Aid to support over 100 local women's rights organizations. So organizations that are um, headed and um, led by uh, women, we, um, by women. And um, we are looking at three areas of um, economic empowerment, political participation for women, and issues of uh, gender-based violence. And having taken a lead on that, one thing that Global Affairs Canada is also very keen around is the issue of um, innovation. Uh, so Kevin, you um, help us go through um, the issues of uh, innovation at some point. So when you talk about innovation, what do you expect from, um, from, from, from civil society? What do you expect from, from development agenda when you talk about innovation? Um, uh, um, could you also tell us if we are looking at um, with, with, the, with the COVID era, the market keeps keeps um, being read uh, practically across the world, and um, lots of economies have uh, lots of sources. Um, so that affects the amount of of, of resources that some um, development, sorry, that some uh, development co developed countries are able to commit towards the development agenda. So I'm aware that a couple of countries, including Canada, US, um, the US and um, the UK, has committed to 0.7% of their uh, GNP to, 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 towards uh, development um, work. Uh, with all of these, what are, the prior what are still the priorities of, of, of development partner uh, amongst the uh, the pandemic, so what are the priorities of development partners uh, amongst the pandemic? And uh, from your perspective, um, I know you sit within the development actor space and you play a prominent role in Nigeria. So, uh, what are the um, likely implications of COVID and the things that would that would change in terms of areas that will be prioritized or areas that will be deprioritized during and uh, after 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 COVID? And uh, what are the strategies development partners have put in place to ensure value for money? So we want to also hear from you uh, issues of value for money. There are a whole lot of things that we would love to hear, hear from you because the unique thing about Global Affairs Canada, you sit in this, uh, you, you sit in this space to represent um, 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 countries that, are, that have um, development uh, arm 
So like the USCID, the DFID, and of course, Global Affairs Canada of this world. So we want to hear from you what your thoughts are on these issues. Kevin. Good morning. Thank, thanks very much, um, Andrew. It's uh, a real pleasure to be on the call today with uh, uh, such a distinguished group of speakers. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to bring in uh, the donor country perspective to the discussion. And uh, I hope I can do uh, justice to uh, some of the issues you just raised. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, country donors continue to play a significant role in, in supporting development in Nigeria across a number of sectors, uh, supporting government at, at, at federal and state levels. Um, now, in, in the COVID and post COVID context, I think there's argu arguably a, a, a much greater need for, for targeted donor support. And so I think a, really, a, yeah, a legitimate question is um, how will this support change in the context of COVID? And I think here uh, it's important to differentiate between, between the what and the how. Um, for me, the what, um, such as areas of focus, priorities, those, those are obviously important. Um, you know, how will the government of Nigeria's priorities change in terms of focus and approach? Um, this will obviously have an impact on, on which sectors donors are engaged in. But I think a more important question is the how question. So how do we do things differently? And I think although COVID is, is pushing us to think more critically about this, um, uh, you know, this idea isn't, isn't new. Um, I think everyone saw the UN cite the annual uh, 2.5 trillion US dollar financing gap uh, to meet the SDGs um, you know, back in the fall. Um, so we're already being pushed to do more with less. That was a very strong message that, um, that we all received. Um, now I think COVID is, is further reinforcing the need to get more out of every dollar to maximize that development impact. So, so I'd like to talk a bit about this, that, that how question today, actually, um, from a few different angles and hopefully touch on some of those, those issues that you, um, that you raised um, in, through, in the introduction. Um, so, so just very quickly, where are we now? Um, you know, country donors are, are actively supporting the government of Nigeria's outbreak response. Um, we're looking to sort of ensure the continuity of our programming, uh, the continuity of basic services, um, and also looking forward to get, you know, to getting projects back up to full speed when it's safe to do so. Um, in terms of what's next for donors, in terms of how we respond, I think this is, it, it, it is a bit tough to speculate right now because we don't really know the full impact of COVID. Um, but although there are many of those um, unknowns, uh, we know that COVID is, is not going away. Uh, anytime soon and that development needs will remain uh, very high for the for the near future. So, so I think we need to do a bit of a st strategic think, rethink about how do we uh, and our partners adapt and build COVID into our existing and future programming, um, keeping in mind the idea of the how, how do we maximize each dollar. And I think this starts with a strong learning agenda. When we look at, at the impact of COVID, um, who was most impacted and why? Um, how are households and communities recovering? What coping strategies were used? Who was the most resilient and why? Um, I think those why questions are, are, are really critical. Um, uh, in terms of learning, let's take the health sector, for example. This is an area that's been a Canadian priority. Um, what are we learning there? Um, you know, more than anything, I think COVID's reinforced the importance of building strong primary healthcare systems, um, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, I think NCDC has done a, a, a really great job. Uh, they've had a really difficult job in terms of, of um, you know, addressing this pandemic. Um, but primary healthcare is really uh, Nigeria's first line of defense, uh, particularly for the most vulnerable. Um, we also need to look at um, ensuring that these systems are able to withstand shocks and ensure continuity of services during crisis. Um, you know, it's been mentioned a few times about you know, the impact of, of lockdowns and, and isolation in terms of the cure being worse than the, the disease um, in terms of uh, an increase of in mortality and morbid, morbidity um, as a result of some of these restrictions. So I think it's important to think about, you know, how do we keep health centers open and, and functioning during crises? How do we better protect health workers? 
and how do we improve community awareness about you know um, the availability and access to services you know i'm thinking particularly about about women and and and, and um, reproductive health how do the how do we reassure them that you can go to a healthcare system and and receive care even during a lockdown and 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 receive care that's safe um, so I think a stronger primary healthcare system will help to do a lot of these things, but we also need to think a bit more about that health security component and how to integrate this into primary healthcare. Um, if we take a look at, at gender equality and issues of gender responsiveness, um, as Andrew mentioned, Canada has a feminist international assistance policy. So, so we really do put women and girls at the center of everything that we do. So in terms of learning related to COVID, um, you know, some interesting issues have emerged. Um, look at testing for COVID. You know, we're seeing that it seems like men are, are getting more tested, um, more regularly tested than women. Why is that? Um, how do we identify and address these barriers to women's equal access to, to, to testing? Um, uh, when we look at sexual reproductive health, um, you know, sadly, in a crisis, women's issues are often, uh, women's health issues are often the first to be dropped. Um, I think we need to look closely and see how this played out in Nigeria and look for ways to strengthen the integration of those services into, into health systems. Um, and then, Andrew, as you mentioned, um, SGBV, uh, sexual gender-based violence, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that to show that this has increased during the crisis. Um, we also know that the closure of schools, other activities can lead to a spike in, in sexual gender-based violence, um, child, early forced marriage, adolescent pregnancy. Um, how do we better mitigate these risks uh, going forward? Um, and when talking about the how, I think we also need to talk um, a bit about financing. I, you know, I mentioned the $2.5 trillion gap, uh, surely larger now due to COVID. So how do we crowd in financing for development to fill some of these gaps? And I think perhaps nowhere else in Africa, um, you know, with its, uh, do we have such a, 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 an enterprising uh, population, a, a, a really strong private sector. So how do we better capitalize on this potential? Um, you know, and I think it's really important that, that we develop new partnerships with um, private sector, uh, private sector philanthropy um, based on shared goals. And I think, you know, this, this is already happening across a number of donors, but um, there's obviously room for more as, as, as Zuera and uh, Odomayo mentioned. Um, there's a lot of influence in the private sector that I think we need to bring to the fore. And it's, it's really great to see all of you here today on this call, because I think this is a real, a real critical uh, piece of the puzzle. And it's great to see your leadership on this. Um, and a final question on that point, I think, um, I think is how do, how do NGOs and CSOs fit into these partnerships um, um, with between country donors and private sector and government? I think that's an important piece of the puzzle as well. Um, on the issue of innovation, um, yeah, I think uh, obviously nothing, nothing drives innovation like a crisis and, and innovation is often the key to maximizing that, that development impact that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, so far I've been, I've been really impressed with the, the dedication and creativity of our partners during COVID. It's been an incredibly challenging situation for them, um, trying to main, maintain services and maintain programming despite all the restrictions. Uh, um, uh, and safety issues for their staff. Um, it's been interesting to see, uh, you know, um, innovation in the area of digital platforms for communication, for training, um, finding new ways to reach out to youth in particular um, has been really key. Um, you know, virtual responses and referral services for SGBV, um, you know, ActionAid on your part, um, you did some interesting things around promoting a feminist approach to to COVID response by government, uh, federal and state governments, making sure that that um, you know essential services for women were not being sacrificed um, uh, while governments were rolling out their their COVID responses. Um, but more broadly, uh, you know, I'm as a donor, I'm I'm always excited to see partners exploring new approaches and and new tools based on evidence using new technology and, and taking smart risks. And I'm really hopeful that COVID will bring some of these ideas to the surface so that we can run together with them. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I would raise another point. I, th I think it's, it's also important for donors to look in the mirror when it comes to innovation. Um, 
uh, COVID has underlined you know, the need for, for more flexibility and adaptability regarding process and, and funding mechanisms to ensure that we're, we're supporting a timely and effective response. Um, so striving to be better um, fit for purpose uh, is something that I think all development actors um, need to work towards, um, including donors. Um, on the issue of engagement partnership at community level, uh, I think that's that's really critical. How do how do we work to ensure that communities take a um, are able to take a leadership role and, and help shape development agendas um, that that have such a big impact on their lives? Um, you know, as a as a country donor, we re we rely a lot on our partners to consult and and, and monitor and respond uh, throughout a project's life cycle. Um, there. There are a few things that I think we're doing more of um, now to make this more meaningful. Um, one is an emphasis on, on analysis upfront. Um, you know, it's no longer okay to just copy paste approaches from one context or country to another. Um, partners really need to understand a deep understanding of community needs and dynamics. And, and as Canada, we, you know, we put a real big focus on gender analysis into this piece. Um, you know, what are the gender issues? What are the root causes? And how do we promote transformational approaches? Um, responsive feedback is another key. Um, this is a bit of a buzzword right now in the development community. Um, you know, how do donors and partners uh, improve the way that they adapt to what they're hearing throughout a project's life cycle, to adapt to what communities are learning and saying, and that feedback, and to make sure that that feedback, um, you know, leads to improvements to activities and and outcomes. And a third point there is, is, is how, how do we get more, more resources into the hands of community groups and CSOs so that they can help drive some more of that change from within. Um, this has been a huge missing piece of the puzzle. Um, as you mentioned, Andrew, um, um, and you know, I'd like to you know, reinforce that, that example from, from um, ActionAid, uh, which is the Women's Voice and Leadership Project. This was a flagship initiative of our feminist international assistance policy. And it's focused on getting the multi-year core funding to grassroots women's rights organizations, because this was a, a, a big gap that we saw, you know, where women's rights organizations were really struggling to secure that long-term sustainable funding that allowed them to, to grow their organizations and expand their influence. Uh, oftentimes funding was very short term and it was very hard to sort of build for the um, look towards the horizon, um, towards what else these organizations could, could achieve and accomplish with, with such a limited um, resource pool. So, so we thought that was a, we still think that's a, a fairly unique approach and, and we really look forward to seeing the lessons that have been learned from that. Um, it's a five-year project, $10 million. Um, so we look to build on that, on that approach to supporting uh, women's rights. Uh, just to, to wrap things up, um, you know, I would, on the issue of, um, availability of resources, um, post-COVID commitment to supporting development. Um, I, would, I would maybe highlight Prime Minister Trudeau's, uh, Justin Trudeau's leadership at, at the UN, uh, a UN event in May, uh, which focused on promoting global cooperation to mitigate the social and economic impact of COVID for, um, for countries who are, who are most affected. Um, and I think his emphasis on, on how the more we work together to help countries recover and strengthen their ability to respond uh, to COVID, uh, the better off we all are. I think that sends a strong message about, about Canada's support in the years ahead. I'll, uh, I'll leave it there, uh, turn it back to you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, really appreciate um, the comprehensive uh, um, diving into all the um, questions and issues we have raised. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. Um, uh, we will come back to uh, a second round, but I would uh, allow my colleague to open the floor and take a couple of questions uh, before we come mm -hmm. back to the final round where we'll be wrapping up. Um, Kemi. All right, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so so Kemi is in Lagos, by the way. <laughs> so um, we're going to take four questions, um, two written and two from the attendees. Um, so uh, the first question is to Darben Saki. Uh, says, how do we get to work on things 
that are considered important rather than donors wants or donors focus that is how do we create the balance between being intentional and working from the beneficiaries um, point the other question um, under the same question still to Deborah Saki is that you talked about better and equal wages is this in relative terms knowing that trade unionism professionalism and the um, different sectors have um, Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get that. Okay, so um, is this in relative terms, knowing that trade union, unionism and professionalism and different sectors have come up with their different skills? Um, the person would want you to expatiate on that. Um, please just note it, I'll run through the questions. So that the two questions are for Deborah Staki. Then um, the next question is um, actually for Odwaya Sawyer. Says for MTN, what is your core purpose for development interventions? Is your CSR activities different from these interventions? And the person would also like to know, how do you select um, your beneficiaries for the scholarship um, initiative? Do you consider people that are living in excluded and poor communities? or you only just um, focus on people in urban centers. So that's for Dabansaki and Oduanyo. So um, please, let's just hold on. Let's take two other questions so that we take the question at once. Um, Catherine Bikestead. Um, okay. So um, Catherine, I'm gonna allow you to talk now. You have just one minute to ask, to ask your question, please. Catherine, are you there? Okay, Catherine is no longer there. So I'm going to allow Felicia Onibon. Felicia, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Dabasaki. Um, I really want to appreciate the history he, he gave us on the women's movement, but we would like to have um, more from him. Uh, because we have different kind of movements today, and we, today we still argue over the fact that there isn't a women's movement in Nigeria. And I do know that uh, all what we have been doing so far tilts towards that, just that it may not be under one umbrella, and that might have been the reason why people are saying that um, there is no women's movement. From history, women's movements come on different issues and they are recorded and they are known as movement that had made impact. So why are we not uh, looking at it in the same manner today? Must we all come under the same umbrella uh, to fight a cause? Could it not be that a group is looking at a particular cause and another group is looking at a particular cause and the causes are being dealt with and the outcome is being seen? I would like him to just give uh, further insight over that and uh, you know it's an issue that we are discussing today and we would right. like him to okay awesome. thank you thank you very thank much um felicia since we do not have any other hands up okay we have um uduak uduak please um uduak are you there yes i am thank you very much and okay, good morning please take your everyone. question in a minute please yes good morning everyone and this is a very interesting um um, discussion we're having here. I'm just wondering if any one of you has mentoring of small and medium enterprises that we wish to also um, have foundations um, uh, uh, in mind. Do you have them as priority? We're looking at a situation where we can have more rural communities and populations reached and if we are thinking about um, um, uh, helping the SMEs to grow in the country, naturally, we should be thinking about helping them form foundations uh, so that, you know, we can reach people. So okay. is there any one of you that prioritizes this? Okay. So um, they would respond to that question. So, um, and the final question will be to Kevin Toka, and this is David Ayale from the Center for 
for citizens and disabilities asking how has your organization ensured access and mainstreaming of disability issues in your interventions so let's start with um Hello, Kemi, you need to unmute. Your microphone is off. Pardon me, pardon me. Um, Kevin, did you hear the question to you? I did, Kevin, thanks. Kevin, did you hear the question directed at you? I did, yes. Okay, all right. Um, let's start with Deborah Saki. Um, Deborah Saki, please, you have four minutes to respond to the questions. Thank you. That sounds like 30 seconds for each question. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the, to the first question about how do you prioritize things that are important to communities as opposed to what donors want? I think actually that's a really good question. And um, the way that I think about it is actually to go back a little bit again. Um, the movements that we had, you know, in our history, they were a lot of them were very organic. They, they were set up or they started because there was some kind of unifying agenda. And a lot of those movements um, were self-funded in some way. And when you think about you know, the evolution of development in this country, particularly in terms of self-help, a lot of the development projects that took place in communities immediately post-independence, a lot of these were in some parts of the country, they were self-help projects. They were not necessarily funded by external third parties. So in some sense, the question to me embeds two things. One is how do we have more organic local organizations that are driven by local agendas and are funded through locally supported means, either by pushing for the governments to invest in local priorities or by local institutions, you know, um, finding ways to raise revenue to invest in those things that are important to their uh, particular community. So that's one way. But the other way is, you know, to the question about donor, donor agendas versus, you know, the priorities of community organizations. Um, so I'll respond to it in two ways. The first is, particularly in the current context, you know, I, and I think Kevin was saying this earlier, that donors need to be more flexible and innovative in the way that they fund particular things, right? So in some sense, in the current moment, there is room to have a conversation about flexibility, you know, that will allow support for a range of things. Um, that being said, a lot of donors also have areas of priority, you know, and donor organizations are set up for any number of things. You know, uh, our colleagues from MTN and the Aliko Dangote Foundation, for example, have set out specific things that their institutions are interested in. And in some respect, those things are based on any number of, you know, motivations. And it's difficult to, to negotiate that they shift from that or that institutions shift from those to something else, you know, uh, particularly because something might be highly important in one community, but may not be so important in another community, but it doesn't diminish the importance of one particular topic over another. It, I think it's a function of where a donor operates, you know, what kinds of things they prioritize to fund. Um, to the second question about wages actually i was talking specifically about you know gender parity in in terms of uh, of wage equity um and maybe it doesn't apply in the cases where you have collective bargaining where individuals don't necessarily have to negotiate their own wages but in the cases where people negotiate their own wages you know and negotiate based on how they value themselves in the market in a number of cases, or in many places, it's been it's become a strong issue that women get underpaid, you know, for than men that do the same work. And sometimes the numbers are very surprising in terms of how much the gap is. So I was referring to actually those cases where individuals negotiate their own um, wages, as opposed to cases where there is a collective system of uh, salary scaling. And then I'll respond to just the last one about whether a women's movement exists in Nigeria. I, I surely do think that 
women's movements do exist. You know, I guess in some sense, you can think about the movement as a collective or an aggregate of all the different pockets of things that are happening across the country, you know, that are organized by women. And I know a number of the people that are participating here also lead movements. So a, in response to COVID-19, for example, um, groups like WODC and um, RAPA came together, you know, to talk about a gender responsive um, response to COVID-19 in terms of including women in the structures, responding to the specific challenges that women face, both in terms of the economic and social dimensions of the problem, and also in specific reference to violence against women and girls. And we've, we've seen spikes in cases of rape, you know, that are surprising in some way, you know, but also raise the need for us to be sensitive and responsive to those particular problems. So those groups do exist. Um, I think if you're talking about an aggregate coordinated national network of women, you know, in some sense that, you know, becomes a, a topic of debate, whether such a structure exists. But also for me, I think the last thing to say is whether there is a need for such a structure, you know, does that structure add value that doesn't currently exist, you know, from the, you know, institutions and networks and movements that exist across the country. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Od this is Odunayo. Your response, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kemi. You're going to, uh, I, I was able to get one of the questions, but there was something that preceded it. But the one I got was um, wanting to know, um, is wanting to know um, how we select the recipients for the scholarship scheme. So there is, um, it is merit-based, so it is not uh, zoned to any, um, what do you call, to any particular group or a geography in the, in the country. So it is merit-based uh, for the science and technology scholarships. We expect that uh, the, the young applicants will have a CGPA of 3.5 and above. And for them to maintain that scholarship, you know, because there's something where we're working towards. And so it, it has to be that you are courageous enough, you know, to take your craft to that level. And so if you have to keep up ha having a minimum GP CGP of 3.5 for you to requalify and keep qualifying. So that, that's the first step. For the one for the, the scholarship scheme for the blind, uh, for the blind uh, ap ap applicants, you just need um, a CGP of 2.5. And uh, we've had people who have graduated with, you know, CGPAs of four, uh, even within that uh, category. So what we do is that you apply. Once you apply, um, there's a verification that is done. We, we have implementation partners that are accredited. And so they run the verification process. Once uh, you're shortlisted, then you come in for an essay writing test. That's what, but, but this time it's all going to be online. Uh, we're not going to have physical, yeah. So, so pretty much that's how we, we, we run, yeah. Okay, so um, the question was that, why do you consider people living in poor and excluded communities? So evidently this is just at the university level. So um, people living in poor and excluded communities that they've not even had the opportunity of transitioning to secondary school. That means um, you literally do not work in that area. So, but that was what the question was about. But then the second question was to ask um, the ugly MTN's CSR activity. Is it different from the interventions of the foundation? So um, MTN Foundation is MTN's vehicle for corporate social uh, uh, investments and responsibility. So it is, so MTN, MTN's CSR agenda is, it finds expression through the foundation. But the, the, the good thing again about MTN as a company is that there's an element of CSR in virtually everything we do, even as a company by, you know, by itself. But yes, the foundation is, uh, you know, the, the, the CSR vehicle for MTN Nigeria. Okay, all right, thank you very much. So we'll go to Kevin now. Kevin, please, your response. 
Yes, hi. Um, thanks, thanks for the question uh, about uh, integrating um, people with disabilities into, into programming. Um, you know, Global Affairs Canada um, has a mandate to focus on the most vulnerable. Um, and, and this includes um, all those who face uh, discrimination and, and exclusion. Um, I think the you know, when you look at our policy, there's a there's a very big focus on on women and girls as as um, you know um, being a, one of those groups. But it it goes beyond that. Um, and you know, one tool or analytical process that that we use in Canada and that other donors use as well is is gender based analysis um, plus or GBA plus. Um, and that's a tool that, you know, an, an analytical tool that allows us to look beyond sex and, and gender um, differences and looks at um, some of the sort of changing, changing realities and, and inequalities that, 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 are, that, that di diverse groups of people face um, in communities. And I mentioned earlier the importance of, of um, us in demanding a deeper analysis by partners. And this is an important part of this, you know, when they, when don't, when, um, when organizations pitch pitch a project to us, they need to demonstrate that they're they're considering all of these angles. They're looking at all of the, the the vulnerable and marginalized groups in 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 the area that they're working to make sure that um, um, their views, their needs are considered in project design. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, before I hand over to Ene now, um, I think um, Madam Zuera can answer the SME question. Um, wanting to know if um, you have uh, a mentoring scheme for SMEs that wishes to, uh, SME that wish to start foundations. Um, Udwak's question. So that's a really good question actually. Um, I think we've never specifically thought about setting up a, an actual mentoring program to, to encourage SMEs to, to, to do, to set up foundations. But I think we're very open to sharing what we know, to giving advice. Like if, if somebody, if there's an SME that is interested in setting up a foundation, all they have to do is, you know, send us a letter, we'll tell them what we know. I mean, we've done it for many others um, in the past has just that it wasn't it's not a program so we don't have like a specific thing that we're outreaching to get SMEs to 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 set up foundations but I think it's a really important um, point I mean like I said earlier it's it, it the key is to just know that we are the actors of our own I'm gonna say destiny right so nobody is going to be able to solve Nigeria's problem besides Nigerians. And if we understand this, that means that whether you're in the private sector, whether you're a civil society organization, whether you're you know, in public service, it's up to us to do it. So the more we can help each other do what needs to be done so that our country can be you know, on track to you know, meet the metrics that we want for ourselves, better education, better health, you know, a better, uh, better prepared population to handle everything, our food security issues, you know, our dependency on oil, manufacturing industry, people with disabilities, gender issues. I mean, it's up to us, right? So other people can help us. And within that help, we need to figure out how to develop our own. So I'm very open and I am speaking on her behalf, but I'm sure that Odunayo would have no problem sharing or encouraging a particular SME, you know, to set up a, a foundation. That's something that we would happily do. Okay. Um, but it's a really um, question. Okay, I'm gonna have to take two more minutes of your time. Um, we have lots of representative of local NGOs in this um, webinar, and the major question everybody wants to know is, how do they partner with the Alingo, Aliko Dangote Foundation? on CSR or, or, or on any project. So how was the partnership model like with you? So, to, okay, so partnership, maybe maybe we're not gonna call it partnership. Maybe it's um, uh, grant. I'll give you a, 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 a honest answer. We already have our strategy on what we're gonna do. Right. So if we're working on, if I look at our nutrition program, Adfin, 
we are going to have to deliver it with NGOs that we will pay to go and do this program for us, right? So we, we, we flow a grant through these organizations to go and deliver what we want. 90% of the partnership requests that we get are things where there's an organization that is interested in doing something that's not connected to my focus area and they want us to support them, respond to them and call it partnership. So that's where that's those don't work out because I also have a board uh, just like a company does and we can only do things that are connected to our mission. So if um, let me pick an example that's outside of what, I'm, what we could do, what we could fund. Somebody wants to do a library in their hometown school. That's a wonderful idea. That's great. And I, if we could just give money to whoever we wanted to give money to, we would absolutely encourage that. But that's not part of our strategic area of focus. So it's difficult. How would we, and then how would we, everything we do, we have to be able to count back as impact for what we're doing. So the same way Odunayo was talking about m and &E and having, um, you know, reporting back impact, they have to, you know, everybody has to be able to report, what do we do with the money that was given to us? What results do we achieve? And to say that I funded a library in a school, in a village somewhere, I don't know how to add that up to my own um, results, right? So I know it sounds cold, like we don't care about other people's issues, but just remember, we also have our own strategic realities that we have to focus on and we have to deliver on our mandate. So we work with NGOs all the time to help us deliver the stuff that we do, whether it's food distribution, we work with NGOs to help do the delivery for us, we pay them to do it. So it's not like we don't partner with NGOs, but the partnership has to be that you're helping me deliver something that I need to be delivered, not that you have your own idea and then you want us to sponsor you and then you know say that we're partnering i, th I think that's just the honest um answer okay thank you thank you very much i will not be taking any more questions at this time but what we do intend doing is to collate more questions and reach out to the speakers then we'll collate the responses and share with all participants and then we'll be over to you ma'am Okay, um, thank you very much. I think our system is go going slow. I don't know what is happening to the internet, but I hope you all get to hear me. Uh, a big thank you to the panelists. You know, big thank you. Well done for the detailing. And, uh, you know, a lot of details have emerged. And I think I will say that, yes, we have achieved, you know, the purpose for this uh, meeting. It's really exciting to hear a lot from uh, our panelists, you know, starting from, you know, Dabesaki, you were the right person to have started it in the first place because you gave us so much history down the line, you know, uh, which is quite exciting. I was also looking at, you know, the evolution of civil society in Nigeria, and I'm looking at, you know, the, the history of the Aba Women Riot and the other things that have happened in terms of female, the movement, and the emergence of uh, women in Nigeria which was a very unique one because it was a, the male and the female for the advancement of the Nigerian female. That is men and women, or, you know, including young men, young women for the advancement of Nigerian women, which was a, at the end of the day, though that um, organization went down, but the, the, those whose skills were built, most of the organizations, civil society organizations today, you know, sprang up from, from that environment. Many of them went into the campaign for democracy, which was in the foremost again in the struggle for social justice. In not uh, missing it too is a women's struggle in the labor movement. You know, some little, little things, getting into women commission of the Nigerian labor movement and uh, all of that, you know, came on board. But it's really exciting to see what has happened and the emergence of a very strong uh, feminist platform you know, uh, now in Nigeria, it's uh, gone into a WhatsApp group that they're doing wonderful things because anything that happens to any girl in Nigeria or any woman in Nigeria is reported in that platform. And the energy that comes after it and the running and the mobilization of resources, mobilization of people. So if you touch a woman now, you get reactions from all over the country. It's so easy to coordinate. The social media has been very, very helpful. So it's really exciting. 
I'm not going to look at all of the things that uh, has been said because time is not uh, our time, but uh, uh, just a little insight of uh, the way of actually in terms of strengthening our resource uh, mobilization. What are the strings of ways of our looking for um, uh, you know, funding? I, I was very, from Oduayo's, uh, Oduayo's uh, you know, presentation, I was looking at that 1% after tax, not even before tax. That looks quite exciting for me. It means that MTN can really do so much for Nigeria. And it shouldn't be after tax. I thought it should be before tax because charity organizations, you know, I will, we will engage with that later because you know, there should be a rebate of some sort when an organization is trying to move in some funds into you know, social co corporate responsibility. And so it means that MTN can do a lot more for Nigeria and uh, expand their, their, their prospects. And I think other foundations also should be allowed in charity organizations across the world. They allow you to take you know, that amount of money before tax because you are doing a charity you know, to organizations. But on, uh, on action aid, there are three strings of funds that come in. We have what we call institutional funding, which is accounting for about 80%, almost 80% of our funding. That is when we see funds and we go in and write proposals and some organizations also come to us, you know, and ask us what we are, ask about what we are doing and how they can strengthen. And then we write uh, proposals. So a lot of funding has come in, you know, from uh, Global Affairs Canada, uh, Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, for fund we, we uh, receive funding from several foundations and also organizations, development partners, you know, across board that we look at institutional funding where we have to struggle for. The origin of action aid is a child sponsorship, you know, where, you know, some organization individuals in different countries, we have the UK, you know, uh, we have uh, the UK, um, Italy, a few, you know, uh, action aid uh, country programs in different countries that sponsor children in Nigeria, you know, and so, and putting more in schools, that leads us to go into the communities, we have built hospitals, built schools, uh, dilapidated classrooms, and a host of others, that accounts for that, but because of the dwindling economy, that is also draining down and so we came up with another area, which we call community sponsorship. That one now gave us the opportunity to introduce funding from Nigerians for Nigerians. And that is that encouraging staffing, we can come into your organization and ask, you know, if we can introduce it to your staff, where individuals give as little as 2,000 a month, you know, to be able to sponsor a child, because in our work, we realize that that 2000 is able to put uh, children in school. And so we have a, you know, like he's on the screen, it's like helping. Can you help another child? You know, with 2000. So we have a, we now have a massive movement of uh, individuals that are supporting that allows us flexible funds. That 2000 becomes 24,000 a, a, a year, a year. And some people are giving more, some adults, some people are giving you know, maybe 50,000 a month, we have been able to take in some organizations come out and give us 100,000 a month, and they have been consistent over the years. In that area, we said, go give, you know, um, Nigerians for Nigerians, because Nigerians can give a lot of things. They can give individually. And we are encouraging, that is called community sponsorship. It's enabling us to reach out to communities you know, at a go, we where I'm um, actually, uh, actually go to hard to reach areas where many people will not reach. When there is flooding, there are so many areas of this country that people cannot reach, where we have reached and people are on the rooftops. And we have been able to work with different organizations, but flexible funds are not that available. So we encourage all Nigerians that even individuals like each and every one of you, whether you are in a Nigerian or not Nigerian, you are in Nigeria and you can give, you know, we reach out to you. And uh, our, so the community sponsorship, you know, is on ground. It's one of the major areas. And we say uh, corporate social responsibility can, you know, build into that environment. And so that's, uh, we thought we will have a big launch during our action at 20 in 2020. 
you know, to also involve uh, the social corporate responsibilities. Where we are now, we are renting. We hope that we, we are going to be able to launch, uh, you know, a funding that can take us out of this environment, you know, to a, a, a property of our own, where we even give support for non-governmental organizations, more non-governmental organizations. You find out that, um, uh, you know, in all of these, you know, we have to uh, approach, you know, paying rent, we hosting the Nigerian Social Forum, for example, we are also hosting, you know, the Women Farmers, you know, so fun, we are hosting them. And, and if we are able to build our own, you know, property, we will give other organizations, younger organizations, you know, uh, accommodation as well. So we are trying to raise funds. Our key focus, you know, um, our target is women, children, uh, girls, youth, and also communities, and uh, people living with disabilities. We make sure that we're able to reach out to them. Our core programs include women's, you know, the issues of women's rights, women empowerment. You know, we are looking at education, food and agri, human security in conflict uh, and emergencies, health, and also governance areas. And I thought uh, the issue of women representation is so key for us right now. And uh, women representation in governance, uh, believing in themselves. I think that is core of some of the things we are galvanizing with the kind of work that we are doing with Global Affairs Canada right now. And then, you know, um, Ford Foundation has come in to enable us to reach more states, mobilizing women-led organizations. Some of the key women led organizations, they are equally, you know, in, in this meeting, and we hope that we can continue to support them. We need the unity of women uh, across, you know, board to be able to take up, but both men and women for the advancement of uh, women. We have not collaborated with, um, uh, you know, um, MTN Foundation before or Aliko Dangote Foundation. I hope this is the beginning of our collaboration with you will continue to backstop civil society organizations in the country. Actually believe that we have capable hands in Nigeria and that with little efforts from you, you know, with more efforts, we can reach out to more organizations, you know, to, uh, for a higher impact in Nigeria. Transparency and accountability is key for us. We have our board, you know, in place and also we render our external accounts, you know, audited accounts every year and to ensure, and we try to provide support for all our partners to be, you know, uh, quite focused. And so um, connecting with the individual is very key for us because it's the individual that makes up the collective. And so the quality of Nigerians and the quality of those who are in struggle, uh, are in the struggle uh, is quite key for us. We believe in the Nigerian civil society. We believe in the essence of uh, uh, the struggle that is on now but we are confronted by so much. So I want to say, you know, I hope that we can collaborate more. I hope that we can look more in the area of, um, you know, how effective the Nigerian civil society organizations, you know, can be raised. And also the NGOs and the INGOs, the development partners. So we appreciate each and every one of you for what you are doing. We know that together we can do more. There are some times that is not only funding but the ideas and also the energy around, we should be able to collaborate and look at what each other is doing and see how we can do more and also provide the technical assistance. So for time's sake, I wanna say a big thank you to Kevin, whom we had to wake up early in the morning all the way from Canada. We thank you, we assure you of our commitment to continue to work very hard, you know, and uh, you know, our partners are also, you know, they are doing great job. I thank you, um, uh, Odunayo, for your time this morning, and I hope we can call on you again. We can, we assure you that we, you know, a lot of people want to hear from you what is going on. You know, we want to know more about what you are doing, you know, to be able to put it on record that this is what uh, is being done in Nigeria. And I hope that when we invite you um, for further, you know, uh, discussions, it's good to come out and tell us what is going on and we can harness, you know, the things we do Dabisaki, I know had to run, you know, for Ford Foundation. I want to say a big thank you for the presentation you have done and uh, for Aliko Dangote Foundation. We're really uh, exciting and I thank uh, all the participants for staying tuned this morning. 
and a big thank you and well done. We look forward to following up on some of the discussions that uh, we have had and uh, we look ahead. Well done. Um, sorry, just a quick one, Andrew. Just a quick one. So um, from MTN, so if you have if you, have, if you want to nominate a community for sponsorship by MTN, um, text MTN to 321. So you text MTN, MTN in capital letters, to 321 if you want to nominate a community for MTN sponsorship. Thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Odwayo. Thank you to Madam Zohar. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you, Davasaki, to a uh, wonderful participant that I've stayed through the process, those on YouTube, those on Facebook. We say thank you very much. One thing um, that has come out clearly here is the need to increase our collaboration. We need to increase partnership. So I'll be reaching out to um, the um, our panelists. I'll be reaching to, out to Madam Zohar to MTN Foundation. I'll be reaching out to uh, Aliko Dangote Foundation. And of course, I reach out to Kelvin and um, the Ford Foundation, Global Affairs Canada, for us to see how do we improve or increase on this collaboration. There has been collaborations in the past, but we want to step it up. We want to increase it. I'll leave you with um, the word of uh, Helen Keller. It says that alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. Uh, I'm sure that together we'll be able to do so much for um, the country Nigeria. On behalf of ActionAid, we say thank you for being part of this webinar series. And like we said earlier on, we are going to share um, the report with everyone. And um, all the, um, the policy brief as well that will come out from it will also share with everyone. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye and have a nice day out there. Hmm. <sighs>